I'm excited to introduce Peter Reed Miller. Peter's been a friend of mine for a long time. Uh, I'm also a huge admirer of his work. Uh, you know, it's funny because uh, people know me for doing sports, but He's the godfather of, of sports with his book, which is right here. Oh, you, can, you see, I don't know if you can see it or not with my green screen. You can't, but it's here. No, it's Hold disappearing. It's, it's Hold on. I can do this. Watch this. Let's see. Virtual background. Off. There. The book. Yeah. The book. Uh, okay. So the, the, th the thing about the book is it's currently out of print, but... I was speaking to someone today. I'm working very hard to get a second edition out. Um, may take me a little while, but it'll be out there. We'll do some updating, some modifying, a little bit about the mirrorless, and uh, hope to have it out by the end of the year. So stay tuned. Great. I mean, here's a guy who's uh, you've done more Olympics than I have. I'm on going on seven. You're uh, you've done, I've done nine. Nine. Uh, yeah. And way more, you know, here's a guy that's got over 100 Sports Illustrated covers, uh, done, you've done everything, Super Bowls, uh, Stanley Cup, NBA Finals, uh, horse race, you know, everything. You, you are the, uh, you are the Super Bowl <laughs> for sports <laughs> photographers. I can't tell you how many people have emailed me and said, like, someday I want to, you know, become a Sports Illustrated photographer. And I said, well, good luck with that now. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a you, joke You were now. there at the heyday of that. And, um, yes, I was. How did you, I want to start with this. How did you get started in both photography and also in sports photography? Well, I started photography in high school uh, and I worked on the, on the yearbook and it was just, you know, back then it was just general shooting and you shot the sports. It wasn't a big, it was a, a boarding school back east. So it wasn't a big sports school. Uh, but then I, I got kicked out of there. So I went to Pasadena High, in Pasadena, California. And again, sh shot for the yearbook, but there now, there were sports were a bigger thing. And so I shot more, but I still shot other stuff. Then I went to USC and again, shot for the yearbook, which is always a great thing because you were doing everything. And, uh, but over time at USC, the sports were such a preponderance uh, there that I found myself, you know, really getting into that. Um, I started working for the people who produced the game programs, the athletic department. And, uh, you know, I had an amazing break. I, I was, I was at a, I, I kept trying the Rams and chargers. I wanted to get into the NFL. No, no reply, nothing. And I, I'm at a game, I'm at a Rams game in the stands and I buy a program and I open the program and on the first page, there's a masthead and there's an, an address in LA, which is where NFL had their creative services at the time. So on Monday morning, I picked up that thing, I dialed that number, and I asked for the guy on the top of the list, John Wiebush, and he answered his phone. <laughs> no, no voicemail, no email, no nothing. He answered his phone. And this is the ironic part. He said, well, yeah, um, my wife's taking a master's at USC. We go to the games, and I've seen your work in the programs. So we'd love to have you doing some shooting for us. So... There you go. People ask, you know, there's nothing to compare it for anybody else because it was just blind, not blind luck, but it was just. Uh, no, it's per, that's uh, persistence and tenacity is what yeah. that is. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and it does take that. I tell people this all the time. It takes, you know, it's, you know, I, if I had a nickel for every person who asked me, how did you shoot the Olympics? How'd you get the Olympics? I'm sure you've had this too. Um, you know, we'd be rich people, right? Yeah. And it's uh <laughs> You know, and I tell people there's so few credentials, it's really hard to get. And, and I think that's true for sideline passes at the Super Bowl, oh, yeah. or actually at any NFL yeah. game, especially yeah. now. And this is something that is uh, amazing. Now, have you shot any sports in the COVID times yet? Because I haven't. No, I haven't. I mean, I've talked to the guys who've been out at the Dodgers and at the A's, and it's pretty weird. Uh, Dodgers, everybody's up and all the way up in the up the first deck where they have the handicaps things and you're behind the net you can put remotes down on the field which is why you still see on the field angles but it's all remotes but basically you're shooting from up there the a's are a little bit more friendly they let people kind of work their way down in the lower seats but the dodgers don't um what's going to happen in the nfl i hear a different story every day I hear 12 photographers on the field. I hear 35 photographers on the field. I hear we'll go up in the stands, but they're supposed to put tarps over the stands. So I'm not sure how that's going to work. So I'm just like, you know, totally just on the, you know, waiting to hear 
waiting to hear. Don't know. If, don't know if I'll really work this year or not. Yeah, yeah. So I, I was watching the NHL is about to start up their season, uh, and yeah. they're doing it in a bubble. And um, they've done the same thing. They've, they've tarped off the first thirty rows or so with the logo. And of course, I was thinking, great, there'll be more uh, credentials because if no one's in the stands, you're not blocking anybody, so we can shoot anywhere in the glass you want. Yeah. As it turns out, they don't want anybody around those athletes no. or no. Uh, potentially, I guess. Uh, creating that risk, right, of getting them sick. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. Crazy. Well, they'd love to, if they, if, you know, that's probably going to happen anyway, but they'd love to have somebody like a photographer to blame for it. You know? <laughs> so, so, but uh, no, I, I have no idea what's going to happen there and, and how it's going to stay. I know, I know the Angels are very tough. Um, they have very few photographers in there. Uh, but it's it's just uh, and you can't move your position. You're wearing a mask and gloves. You have to bring your own food. There's no no access to the press box. No access to the media room. That's all gone. And, wow. and so you're kind of on your own there. Where where would you post from? I, I guess you just sit in the stands with your laptop and yeah yeah. Well, and... you got plenty. You got plenty of room. And so you just put your laptop. Yeah, we we'll all have pretty good Wi-Fi in the stadiums. And uh, out you just do it right there. Wow. wow. Yeah. It's funny because what seemed like it would be easier because you wouldn't have to deal with any of the crowds actually mm -hmm. is harder because they just don't want people there. And no one knows what's going on right now. I'm shooting an event in a couple weeks, a private event in someone's backyard. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a, an executive at, at one of the big tech companies here. And mm -hmm. they're asking every vendor and everything, every person potentially to get COVID tested prior to the event. Prior to the event, yeah. And, uh, of course, I'm a total wuss. For those who are out there listening, uh, I do not like medical stuff. My dad was a doctor, and I, I don't know if <laughs> the medical rounds with my dad uh, created this. Oh, I wouldn't call it a phobia. I, I'm okay with shots now mm. and, and dentistry mm. and stuff. But having that thing shoved down into my brain, like. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's, like, it does not feel good. I've, I've had it done, and, and uh, um, I've also had the other, the, the rapid test, which costs under $25, but. Uh, that they just swab your mouth. That's the one I want. I, want. I told myself, yeah. bring me that one and I'll do it. <laughs> so. Some people are waiting in LA, waiting five days for their test results. What good is that? You know, you just got to shut yourself down for five days if you think you've got it. And by the end of five days, you'd probably know you got it regardless of the test. So yeah, five is good. I've, uh, heard, I've heard longer as well. So yeah. it's interesting that it's interesting to me that different teams are treating it differently. You think that the oh, yeah. MLB or NHL, whatever, is, would say, okay, this is the rules that every team has to follow for press credentials or how many people on the field or whatever. So it's interesting that the A's have something different than the Angels would. Mm. Well, I think the thing to remember about pro sports leagues is the teams really hold the power. These team owners are, you know, wealthy, usually kind of egotistical guys. They don't see, I mean, they have a commissioner, they kind of observe them, they want them to set rules, but if they don't like the rules, they're not going to abide by them. And, and particularly in the NFL, uh, but I think also in the, other, in the other major sports, it's really the teams are the final word. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it, there's a lot of politics in there as well. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's interesting that and sometimes you have to fight really hard to get credentials to get on the field. You get out there, and sometimes you'll run into like some high school kid, and oh, who's got some... like a consumer grade camera lens who doesn't know what they're doing. And you're like, "How did you get down here?" And they, "Oh, you know, my dad's best friends with or yeah, whatever." Yeah. Right? You've seen. I know. There's so like much that. hypocrisy, but or the the social media people who will be down there with an iPad, and. <laughs> um, well, I was at a, I had took my class to a, a earthquakes game a couple of years ago and we were all set up, you know, back behind the goal and everything like that. And, um, a goal came out, was pretty close to the goal. Somebody came in and, and took a shot and this kid who'd been sitting there just playing with his phone, you know, dee, 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 dee. all of a sudden he stands up, steps forward, blocks everybody to get that picture with his phone. It was like, and you know, I am old enough that I just thought, let it go. He's, you know, he's empowered. He's working the team, social media, whatever. So just let it go. But it was like, yeah, that's what we got now. Well, you've done the Olympics enough to know the politics there. And I've talked about this on previous uh, Zooms and podcasts and things. 
the, there's even the pecking order there where, you know, you have a great shooting position and you get into a great spot, you get there an hour ahead and, you know, they're practicing, you're like, this is a great spot. And then, you know, 20 minutes before the start of that event, OBS, sorry, Olympic Broadcasting shows up, yeah, sets yeah. up their camera right in front of you and yeah. they don't care, right? We're it's the little man the totem pole. <laughs> yeah, they're rights holders, yep. Yeah, so yeah. there's that pecking order that uh, that people have to, have to deal with. And speaking of, of all of this, uh, and actually for anybody who's on, if you guys have questions, go ahead and just put them in the chat area and I will monitor that. So if you have questions for Peter or I, go ahead and feel free to throw them in there and I'll watch that. Um, and uh, and then we can also open it up, although it's gonna be a little tougher to, um, to if everybody's audio is on. But uh, I wanna ask Peter, and I see that people are starting to ask, so I'll, I'll get to that. But Peter, in the meantime, uh, I'm going to ask you, it's kind of fun to put you on the spot because everybody does it to me. So I'm going to do it to you. <laughs> if people always ask me if I have a favorite image uh, or an iconic image or actually answer both. So what's the most iconic image you, sh you shot? And also like, what are some of your favorite images you take? Well, I can, I actually can, can show you probably if this thing will come up. Um, I, uh, I think my favorite image is, is, is what I call it my favorite mistake. Um, Okay. Um, geez, Louise. Okay. Uh, is the the uh, Ladanian Tomlinson uh, image going over the line? And uh, you know that's on the cover, on the of, my cover book. of the book. Yeah, yeah. And it was a mistake. It was a mistake. I had an assistant. He had the seventy two hundred over his shoulder. Did the old elbow rub on on the uh, on the on the dial for the shutter speed. Knocked it down to a fiftieth. I shoot on shutter priority, so the camera went to f22, <laughs> and so got that nice little sparkle. And I just, I just followed him, and I happened to, to get him in one spot. But it was like, I, when I looked at it in the camera, I thought, oh, it's, I just screwed the focus, you know. And it was like, uh, it was not a good thing. But um, so, Peter, I, um, I, so I have to ask you. I, I've seen that shot. I actually used that shot to promote this because it was mm -hmm. my favorite as well. Um, and I'm looking at the cover of the book right now, and I thought to myself, I don't know if I can say this, I thought, man, that guy's got balls to roll his shutter speed this slow and pan with a running back or you know, with, with an athlete through, because that's, well, and similar with the images that's on here now behind me, like the difference is that I shot over and over and I got my safety shot and then I yeah. shot these, where in the NFL, I, these guys are very predictable, right? As they're skating by, I know where they're going to be. I thought to myself, man, that is hard, what you have on that shot. So it was a happy accident, huh? It was, you know, I've made so many mistakes in my career that have gone against me that I'm not, I'm not troubled by taking credit for one that went in my favor. You know, it's, that's the way I think of it. It's, I, you know, I could pretend that I had this all figured out and everything like that, but it's easier to tell the truth. It's that's, always that's is. great. So is that is that also your most what, like what was your biggest seller or like your kind of marquee image that you know when people think of you they think of that shot or is it that shot? Well, I I think yeah I think that's the number one. I mean I don't know about sales. You know at Sports Illustrated, it, it's kind of a specific shot. We it was very good for me because uh, Canon at the time was still an NFL sponsor. So they actually produced an ad, although they had to still pay Ladanian some more money. And then I won the Pro Football Hall of Fame contest with it. So, so that, was, that was good. Um, so fame and fortune, you know. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I, I've got a couple that I, that I really like. But then, you know, photographers are bad at picking their own pictures. I mean, it's so not a real... Yeah, it's, if it's not a super standout, I'm kind of like, you know, well, I like this a lot. And uh, my uh, my ex editor Steve Fine, uh, who was the director of photography at SI, always would say photographers like the pictures that were hardest to take. Yeah, <laughs> and they not, they aren't necessarily the best pictures, but but uh, yeah, actually, my um, my biggest selling image, like where I made you know tens of thousands of dollars selling it uh, for mm -hmm. an ad campaign, I thought was one of my most pedestrian images I've ever shot. Yeah. But I wasn't complaining. <laughs> they liked it. No, they wanted no. it. I was like done. Uh, so yeah. yeah. So um, when you're shooting, um, are you shooting for a shot, or are you hammering the shutter 
to see what you got? It depends. I mean, I, you know, in, in terms of, of, uh, of what I do when I go out to, you know, this is all sort of past. Now I go out for AP and it's pretty clear we have a hit list and we, we are looking for, you know, certain players, et cetera, et cetera. But when we used to go out for Sports Illustrated, there were kind of three ways it could go. You're going to just cover the game. It's a playoff game. We want, we want the winners. We want the touchdowns. We want the winning quarterback, coaches, all that stuff. So you're following the game, which is great. Uh, second way is just you're going for a player and you just stick on that player. And that can be good, it can be rewarding, but it, it is, it's a little different. Um, you miss a lot of other stuff. I mean, like if you're following a wide receiver, by the time he gets uh, off the line and by the time you figure out in most plays that he's not gonna make the catch, the play has already happened on the other side of the field. That's why he ran out that way. But, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, and then the third one, which was the best, was just go out and make some pictures that we can use in leading off. You know, it's going to be a nice day in San Francisco. Go up there wearing red, you know, go up there and just shoot. And th yeah. that was that was the, the best of, of it all. But um, so, you know, uh, it, it really depends. I mean, I think that whenever you go out to uh, to shoot something, to shoot an event, you should have something in mind that you want to get. You should have some sort of picture in mind that you want to create. And maybe you're not going to get that, and maybe you're going to get something else, but at least you have a starting point. You can go there and you can say, okay, let's see, what can I do to get this, this picture? And, um, you know, that, that to me is, uh, is you know, that's, that's one of the keys. So. so have you tried to duplicate the Tomlinson shot on purpose? I'm assuming you probably slowed that shutter down and try to duplicate yeah, it. Yeah, I've right? done it, but it's 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 a one in a kind kind of a thing, you know. And and that's that's sort of where it, you know where it goes. And and so I've never come. I've had some other blurs, but never anything quite quite like that. So and actually, this is uh, and, and I'm I'm not ignoring the questions. I promise everybody. But this is something that I'm interested in with the R five. Um, you know, or the R series in general with mirrorless and especially with mm -hmm. this new face detect. It'd be interesting to see if the panning, if we get more take on mm -hmm. the panning because of the fact that we can uh, lock in on the eyes and track them at a slow shutter speed. It'll be interesting to see. That will be interesting. I, I I, mean, the, the eye detect is pretty amazing, but I'm not sure. I mean, that, that, should, that should help you on the panning. I hadn't thought about that, but... Um, you know, you still got to get that. I mean, yeah, it'll focus, but you still have to because you got a lot of depth of field when you're panning because you're you're like at f11 right. or something like that. But but uh, uh, I mean, the key is that you get that face sharp. Yep. You know, if the face isn't sharp, it's not. You know, there's nothing else to it. So you know. yeah, and for those who are on who don't understand all this, uh, it basically you know normally when Peter and I are shooting sports, we want to get at least a thousandth of a second in that range. To freeze yeah, the action or more these days or more yeah. yeah especially if you're doing things like uh bobsled and luge whatever mm -hmm. you might want to be at four five thousandth of a second but um yeah. if you slow that shutter speed down and pan with the action it really does it yields images like if like everything's reversed uh like yeah. this where everything in the background is blurry and uh the athletes not and that's really kind of the goal right. it's it's a hard technique it's the one that um that everybody uh, you have to practice just like you would a foreign language, right? You, you sit there, you, you plant yourself, you, you pan. And, uh, and I'm sure Peter will tell you every one of your motion pans comes out perfectly, right? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 Everyone. Yeah. No, I do a lot of pans on, on the finish of sprint races and, you know, so many things have to work out. The right guy has to be ahead. He can't be blocked. You know, it, it, there's there's so many things that that's a, like one in a hundred kind of a shot that really works. When it works, it's great. It's marvelous. But but um, yeah, the know, shot from Rio that blew my mind was the shot of Hussein Bolt that was motion panned as he turned and looked toward the photographer. You've seen that one, and yeah, yeah. and I thought to myself. That is a one in a million type shot to get that. It was, you know, you have to, again, you have to have the cojones to, to shoot it at such a yeah. slow, slow shutter speed. But of course, if you're shooting for an agency and you have 10 other shooters, they still tell that guy, you take the risk, but yeah. it's still incredible. 
Yeah, I mean, that's the way we used to do it. We put 10 people on 100 meters. And so anybody who wanted to do something, you know, experimental, they, they could, as long as they said coordinated. So there was somebody else covering what they were supposed to be covering. Right, so, yeah. And I don't have that. Nice. I don't have that luxury because I'm a one man show <laughs> at the Olympics. Yeah. Which of course, yeah. normally, if it was not COVID, it would be the Olympics right now, which is really mm. frustrating to be sitting here. Not that I'm frustrated with all of you here, but like I'd rather be the Olympics. Just sorry, it's just the way it is. Um, yeah. So, uh, Peter, I'm gonna get to the questions here, but I'm gonna ask you one more of mine, which is: okay. Have you always been a cannon shooter? No. Um, like. Well, actually, my very first interchangeable lens camera was a Canon, was a Canon rangefinder, a Canon VT or 5T. It was great because it had the, the, the advanced lever across the bottom, so you could like really whop on it. You get about two frames a second out of that thing, you know. Uh, then I, when I went to an SLR, which I did pretty quickly, like everybody in that era, I went to Nikon. You know, Canon wasn't really much of a factor back in what would have been you know, the, the seventies. Uh, and I stayed with Nikon on into the eighties. And then I made a switch to Canon uh, in the early eighties because they had a 400 to eight and Nikon didn't. And uh, that was the new F1 camera, but they didn't have, they didn't have a good six. They didn't have at this point, they had a very slow flash uh, sync speed. I think it was a 90th. Hmm. And Nikon was bringing out those FMs with a 250th. And there was, and I used to write letters. I, I did some ads for them. So I, I, I met a lot of these people and I used to write these letters to the president of Canon saying, look, you got to do this, you got to fix it. Because their longer lenses all had this rack, this rack and wheel kind of focus. It was never, never worked well. And so um, after the 84 Olympics, kind of at the 84 Olympics, I switched back to Nikon because guess what? They had a 428 now too. And so I went a few more years with Nikon and then right around the 90s, and I'll never forget this, I was at a USC game, and uh, Walter Yost, who's a you know, great SI photographer, came up to me with his Canon lens, and he had a, a, an EOS body, and he said, uh, take a look at this and check out this autofocus. And it was like, wow, it really works. So I was back there. I was back there and I stayed back there and I'm happy. I mean, long before anybody else at Sports Illustrated, except for Walter, had switched uh, from Nikon. I was Canon. I was killing them. <laughs> I was oh. there. Those are great days. Those were, but then everybody kind of switched and all the cameras caught up and it's, you know, it's all crazy now, but, but, uh, but yeah, I'm happy I stayed with Canon. Cool. All right. So uh, some of the questions, actually, there was a comment from Steve Roberts who says that uh, at Nissan Stadium, there's someone who shoots the Canon T series that shoots nothing but the cheerleaders and gets credentials from a small state paper, which is really funny because uh, we've all been there. Um, yeah. I can guarantee you this: if I come back from a from an athletic event and I have nothing but shots of the cheerleaders, it will be hell mm -hmm. to pay at home. <laughs> so. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. 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 No, Mark but they. I mean, one. the teams will hire people to shoot the cheerleaders, and you see those guys, and they're working hard. But yeah, the other ones who are just like, yeah, yeah, really. yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Dave wants to know your experience so far with the Canon R5 and the focus tracking. And uh, I, I, I have a little bit of an opinion. And again, I'm waiting till I can bang on it more before I write my, my blog about it. But uh, tell us your opinion so far on the uh, your experience with the R5. I, I think it's I think it's excellent. I think basically here's the funny thing when when I uh, there's a document online, it's a white paper on the EOS uh, 1DX Mark III that Rudy Winston wrote. And I read that several times. And I was struck by how much of it talked about shooting in live view. Because who is really gonna shoot in live view? It's very inconvenient, very, you know, but about the focusing and everything like that. And actually I was down in South Carolina like two days, like March 14th, you know, right before the hammer fell. Um, and we had some flag football players as a workshop for somebody else was putting on. And uh, uh, so I did it. And I had a little uh, hood loop and a little thing to hold it on and all that. And it did an amazing job of focusing. So fast forward to the R5, which I think basically has the same processors and focusing system that the uh, Mark III did, but it's, it's, you know, it's a real, it's a full camera. You don't have to use the live view. So I'm, I was very impressed what I saw on the Mark III with live view. And I've been very impressed 
with the R5 with Focus. I think Focus is going to be excellent. I think we're entering kind of a next level of autofocus here. I agree with that. I think, you know, not only for sports, uh, and actually I know with sports with the R5, there's a little bit of the rolling shutter issue. Um, so but you, you don't know, want to leave the mechanical shutter. You right. know, you want us to say it, say it 12 frames per second. Right. Sorry. And, I, and, and actually with the one, the X Mark three, there is a way, uh, Peter, I don't know if, uh, if you've, uh, Canon showed me a way to actually make it so you could do the face tracking, not using live view. Um, uh, let me get this right. There's a way to do it through some settings that actually worked really well. A well, it'll face track uh, through the viewfinder. It will head track, which is really good for football and stuff where people have helmets. It right. won't eye track. It will only eye track through the live view. And then when you move to the R5, you've got people eye tracking and you've got animal eye tracking, right. which I have tried on my cats and it's amazing. It really does work. So, um, you know, th there, yes, there's some advancements there that weren't, weren't in, the, in the Mark III, but, but I think it's a lot of the same components and, and that's good. That's very yeah, good. Yeah, I, I look at the R5 and I think, holy cow, that would be like the dream camera to take to Africa on safari, right? With animal, oh, yeah. you know, because it's hard to track their eyes, especially yeah. if you've got a kill and you've got an animal chasing, if you've got a, a, a I don't know, a, a cheetah running after an animal, yeah. Trying to yeah, track cheetah, them is yeah, brutal. Yeah, yeah. Um, it'd be really interesting to see how well that could work in that kind of scenario, to yeah. see what the take rate would be. And you know, we'll be in Africa, God, God willing, with this, uh, you know, next year. And so mm -hmm. uh, I am dying to take that 100, 500, yeah. 100, 500 lens with the R5 and, right. and put that thing to work there. Especially with the 45 megapixels, you also have the cropping ability to shoot in and then, you know, crop in and still have a 25 right. megapixel image, you know, with a double crop. So, yeah. um, so uh, let's see here. Um, John wants to know what camera set you're using for your webcam. And I, I'm going to say, it looks like you're using a very narrow aperture. You're, you're around one, four. I'm, one, two, I'm at one, four. four. Yeah. I'm, I'm, it's a Canon R body with the R 50 millimeter F one, two, and it's uh, set it at one four. Um, but I think the amazing thing, one of the amazing things is on this dual pixel focus, it fo follows me all over the place. I mean, I it, like this is a, you know, this is a very wide aperture and it, it just stays on me unless it, unless it really wanders off. So, uh, and then I'm running that through um, a black magic ATEM mini switcher. And then um, for this, I'm running it, you know, into my big computer, but when I do, YouTube videos and I tape them. I've got a Ninja 5 to tape it on and I've got four inputs so I can bring my laptop in. I can bring another, I've got another camera back here that shows the whole desk. And so it's my little, my little mini studio here. Is it, uh, is it the R or the Canon R5 that you're using right now? It's the R. Yeah, no, I wouldn't put the R5 up there. It's just, yeah. <laughs> the R, which has sort of become, is probably going to stay there for a long, long time now. I mean, it yeah. doesn't have the options of uh, video, like the frame rates and all that stuff that I don't really understand, but people yell at me when I don't do it right. It only has a couple of options, but still that's fine because we can straighten that out in, in, uh, you know, uh, in the software. But, uh, right. but in terms of being a camera there, it's great. It's great. I've got an AC power for it, so I don't have to worry about the batteries and, you know, it just rocks. That's on. a good thing. Uh, so uh, Charlie wants to know if you could show the image uh, and Charlie, if you go to his website, to Peter's website, uh, Peter Miller website, you will see the image uh, he was talking about. It's right on the homepage. Yeah. So for some uh, reason, thumbs up from Charlie. I, I, so he knows he's got it. I can now. This is just giving you the screen. It's up on my laptop, but for some I saw reason, it for a second. Is, oh well, mainly maybe I'm not seeing. Are you there seeing? There you go. It? I see. Nope. It wasn't it. Nope. I saw an image. No, you saw Italy, you Venice, yeah. I don't <laughs> quite know why this is happening like this. All right, well, I've hold done on this here. show. But um, uh, let me see what else I can do here. But but uh, I've also got but, it. But yeah, you can check it on my website and um, you know, it's around. Uh, let's see. Okay. okay. Yeah, definitely. Peter, can you use can you use share screen and just open? Yeah, I, hold on a second. I'm going to I'm going to pull it up here in a second. So hold on. Well, it's not on this computer. I've got it here, and uh, I'm going to. 
Great. Switch. Great. Thank you. All right, here we go. Let's see how this works. Uh, share screen. Boom. All right. Does everybody see that? Yeah. There we go. All right. There's the happy accident right there. Yeah. I love the starburst at the top. That's yeah, awesome. and I didn't put it in there. That's because it's an F-22. I know. I mean, you know, I tell people all the time, I just did my night photography video, and I told people, if you shoot at that kind of aperture, you'll get that. Uh, yeah. And people think you're using filters or you add it in Photoshop or whatever. Right, so, right. Yeah, not to be. Um, let's see here. Um, do you think, this is, this is a good one. Uh, Steve wants to know, do you think mirrorless would be the future or w and will the DSLR disappear? Yes. Yes, I do. I, I think that that's, um, there's, it opens up so much more. You have the bigger lens opening, uh, thus the light can come out of the lens more straighter at the, at the, uh, at the sensor. Um, they're smaller, they're lighter. I, I think uh, I think Canon probably was developing the Mark III for, you know, years, which they do. And somewhere along the last few years, they woke up to the fact that they were getting, you know, this was a new thing. So they continued to develop the Mark III, but um, they had another team obviously do the, the, the R5. And I don't think you're going to see a EOS 1DX Mark IV. I yeah, I don't either. I, I think if anything, we're going to see an R1 or you yes. know, God knows what they'll call it, but uh, a mirrorless version for, I mean, the, the 1DX Mark III, for those who are wondering, was really aimed at the Olympics because that was, that's typical cycle for Canada is every four years for right. the summer games, right? And right. so that camera, you know, and I, you know, I've had a prototype of that camera for quite a while before it came out to get ready for the Olympics. And of course mm -hmm. the Olympics got pushed. Now the real, the big burning question will be, is it the camera we're shooting sports with a year from now, if we're at the, you know, Tokyo, are we using that? Or are we using a R or something? I mean, it'll be really interesting to see. I mean, I clearly I'll have an R6 or R5 with me for doing mm -hmm. like the uh, mixed zone shots, interview shots, those kinds of things uh, around the Olympic park shots, stuff like that around town in Tokyo. But for sports, mm -hmm. it will be interesting to see what happens. Uh, I think it's too early to tell. Um, and, uh, I know, uh, you know, neither you and I will know that at this point. No, so. no, no, we won't. We won't. We'll, we'll yeah. just hope, um, <laughs> you know, we'll hope I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure there will be one. Um, I think they, you know, they're basically in a competition with Sony and they got, now they have a very competent sort of mid range competitor, but they don't have an A9 and they, they need an A9 killer. Right. I mean, they've got sort of an A7 killer right now or an A7 competitor, but uh, they need an A9 killer. And yep. uh, I'm sure they can do it. You know, I, you, I wish um, they could. I was going to say, I, I just wish they would separate the video from the still, you know, because the video, we have all, you know, these overheating problems, they talk about everything. I mean, it just, it, it, it definitely takes away from what they could do with a pure still camera. Um, but they'll never do that. So, you know, I know, you know it's funny cause, and I know for me, I've always thought I'm a still guy. I don't really care about video. Mm -hmm. And then I started shooting all these videos for my YouTube channel. Um, and, and I know you, so you have your YouTube channel as well. We should both mm -hmm. mention. So if you go to YouTube and you search for Peter Reed Miller or Jeff Cable and you'll find our, and subscribe mm -hmm. to our pages, that'd be great. Um, yes, I started doing all these too. videos and it's like, oh, wow, this really is good. Uh, and so now I'm, I've learned Adobe Premiere and I'm, I'm learning all the stuff mm -hmm. because I got nothing but time right now. But, yeah. um, <laughs> uh, but it is more interesting to me, but still like when I do my reviews of the camera, it's still about stills to me. It's not about video. And to your point, I don't think Canon's going to create separate ones. It's going to be stills separately mm -hmm. from, from video. Uh, have you tried the R6 yet? Cause I have not, I'm, I've, I've held I have not. To play I with it, but, but, uh, not yeah. extensively. It, I mean, it took me long enough to get the R5, so I didn't really push him about the R6. But right. uh, um, I think it's, I think it's going to be a very useful camera for a lot of people because it's more budget-minded, and it's got the same sensor as the Mark III. 
So people are saying, oh, well, it's only 21 meg megapixels or whatever. Well, that that looks fine. Those pictures I take with the Mark III are fine. And I yeah. do, I can crop the heck out of them. And that's that's easy still. So so I think it'll be a good little camera, um, you know. I, I think so too. And, and you know, I, I have held one and play with it. And uh, so uh, Michael Pear is asking, um, how is it for fast moving subjects? I will tell you that the focus mechanism of, of the uh, R6 appears to be the same as what we're seeing with the R5. Um, and the quality of the images. So the so when the R5 and R6 were announced, if you noticed, all of my posts were about the R5. Um, yeah. And then all of a sudden, in my discussions with Ken and others, I thought, wait a second. And actually, on the Zoom call we did a couple weeks ago, uh, we had Calvin on, uh, who's you know mm -hmm. my pro rep, and and Calvin was talking about the fact that because you have so many less pixels on the R6, you have a much cleaner ISO on the R6. So I can actually see myself using an R6 for my event photography. So if I'm shooting in a temple or a church, and, I, right. and to me, I don't really care about megapixels, I care about clean ISO. So yeah. after the Zoom call, I actually contacted Canon and said, you know, hey, uh, can I get an R6 evaluate, evaluation camera as well right away? Because I could see that as being as compelling as an R5, yeah. but like, yeah. for, so it really depends what you're shooting. So Michael, if I'm shooting, in Africa, I want an R5 because I don't have to worry about ISO because generally we're shooting during the daylight. So I'm using mm -hmm. ISO, you know, 160 to 400 tops. Um, mm -hmm. But I want 45 megapixels so I can crop in uh, if something's really far away. Um, but for, for event photography, I think the R6 could be uh, the real sleeper here and it could yeah. be uh, and, and it's also like you said, Peter. It's also less expensive. So, but I think as far as the focus and everything else, I think you're going to see very similar yeah, results good. from the R5. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jeff uh, uh, Mulvihill says, uh, "Let's see. Because of Peter's AP shooting, does he now have to shoot Sony because of their contract with Sony?" No, I'm a contributor. They're only going to do that for staffers. Um, you know, as a contributor, I, I'm not compelled to do anything like that and uh, I think it'll be interesting because some of the best AP photographers that I know are very loyal to Nikon. Mark Terrell who's probably one of the best on the planet and uh, uh, there's a couple other guys who are just I know that AP tried to do Canon about 10 years ago and, and some of the guys just wouldn't switch you know so I think they're going to have that same issue but the the average guy but I did hear something like if you're not in a pro market, if you're an AP office, say in, in the middle of Mississippi, you don't get a 402A. You get a, a 100 to 400. And oh, then the guy who's down there, he shoots Alabama football, but no 402A for him. So I, you know, I think it's, it was basically a cost saving move. And, um, you know, it's not to say the cameras aren't good. And, and a lot of people I see on the sidelines love them. Um, especially the size and the weight. That's the number one thing. I, I know people could talk about all these other features, but I'm, when I come up to Smiley Pool at the Cowboys game, I say, so what do you like? He said, I like the size. I like the weight. And then that's, you know, now, and that's kind of for, for guys who drag them every day all around, that's a major thing. So, yeah. you know, there'll be most of them will switch, I guess, but, but uh, I think you'll see a lot of people still shooting Nikon. Yeah, it is interesting. I, people don't understand all the politics that go on behind the scenes. I know, I remember years ago, we'd shoot the San Jose Sharks games, the NHL games with strobes, and we, we'd be able to pop. Mm. And then, of course, then I think it was AP or Getty that came in and bought out, like, they had the exclusive right to the strobes in any NHL game, and we couldn't use them anymore. Uh, so we had to just shoot wide open, which I actually prefer in many respects anyway. But mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of politics that goes on behind the scenes yeah. and stuff. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, Will wants to know, uh, Peter, what are your favorite non-traditional methods when you're shooting to freeze motion, like motion panning or zoom blurring or whatever? Well, I think pan panning, as we've discussed already, is a great thing when it works, you know? And when it works, it's, you make wonderful pictures. Um, and when it doesn't, you kind of like you got to you got to mess. I don't do zoom. I don't do anything else that you know zooming. I don't do anything else that that would be a uh, uh, you know a weirdness. I mean, I, it's, it's years of thirty five years at Sports Illustrated. Um, they didn't want to see. I mean, they would they would run a pan if you got it maybe, but they didn't want to see other tricky stuff. 
you know. So, yeah, so that's a good point. Let's talk about that for a second. So I know that uh, for shooting for the Olympics or for Team USA, they'll say there's certain athletes they want me to key in on, or there's a story mm -hmm. that they're running, and so there's a story they want us to tell in photos. But if you have a great image, like the Tomlinson image, is that being picked up by them? Or are they going, oh, that's really pretty. It's great as a photographer. And we're glad that, you're, that you got this happy accident. But yeah, but we're not posting that thing. Well, in the days of the, the heyday, when I was still part of uh, Time, Time Inc., um, we had this three, uh, three double trucks in the opening of the magazine called Leading Off. And that's where, if you did something like that, that's where stuff went. That didn't pertain to a story particular, but it was a great picture. And sometimes they came from the staffers, and sometimes they came from the wires, which always annoyed us a little bit. But, <laughs> but uh, they were generally uh, some of the best pictures, sports pictures taken that week, and that gave us a chance to feature them. Hmm. So, so that's what you know. They would not throw away something like that. I think it went in leading off, as a matter of fact, because I don't think this was a. Uh, you know, Chargers Bills game. I don't think it was uh, earth shaking in any other way. I think I was just down there to make a picture. So, right. um, uh, but there was a place for that. Interesting. Hmm. All right. By the way, uh, Anna, you asked, is that the right link to the book? It is. Uh, so that is correct. Um, and John wants to know great question, John. Uh, Peter, have you used the 100 to 500? I have not. I've seen it no. under no. glass as you probably have too. I think when you and I were at WPPI, I think it was, yeah. it was under glass yeah, there. Yeah. But you have not held it and play with it yet. No, no, I haven't, I haven't. Um, you know, I use the two to four a lot. Uh, that's a great lens and you know, it's a great lens for the Olympics, I'll tell you that. And uh, I've used actually their one to four, which is a slower lens, but it's the second edition, not the trombone one, right. the one with the, that is super sharp, super fast focusing, really good. It's just, you know, it's still too slow to go inside with. And, and so, you know, although that changes all the time in terms of what you can do. Um, but that, that 500 zoom, I have not uh, had a chance to, to try it at all. Yeah, I'm really, I'm, I'm intrigued by that lens. Uh, I, I, wish it, I wish it ended at 6.3 or 5.6, not 7.1. Yeah. But, um, but with that said, you know, again, that lens in Africa could be amazing because Oh, yeah. If you're at 500 millimeters and you're at 7.1, you're still going to get book, good, decent bokeh. And um, yeah, I like the extra range because I use the, I, I'm like you. I use the 200 to 400 quite a bit at the Olympics um, mm -hmm. and other things. Uh, and I use the 100 to 400, which is the version two is a fantastic lens. It really yeah. is. Like you said, it's, it you know it doesn't allow for great photography indoors. Uh, well, although I've used it indoors, um, but it's hard to shoot at five six uh, you know indoors yeah. depending on what your lighting situation is. So. Um, so S.P. Murray is asking about the second printing of the book, uh, and Peter did mention that, and I guess we should re-mention it again, that it's out of print right now, right? But yes, you're hoping yes. to get it into a new, a kind of an updated version yes. soon, right? Yes, I, I actually had a conversation right before this, this morning with uh, my former editor, who had been the editor on the book, who's now at another publisher, and because um, give, they've given me the rights back, but they wouldn't give me... Uh, the layouts back, but there may be a way for hmm. us to find those layouts. And then I would, there are a few things I'd like to improve on it, or maybe swap out some pictures, change like the cameras I'm shooting with, right. and do a chapter on mirrorless, because that's that deserves to be in there. But basically, that would be it. So it's not like I'm not gonna write another book, ne never again. But but uh, <laughs> if I could just polish this one a little bit and get it back at a limited run, I might, I'm, I may even do we were talking this morning about doing a a Kickstarter or GoFundMe to to, uh, to pay for it, you know, and just, uh, you know, enough that, that the people, because I get requests every week, and it's like, oh, damn, you know. What's um, funny so about this, on the previous Zoom, or uh, one or two ago, I said, I have free time, maybe I'll write a book. Now you're making me think twice based on your comment, like, I'll never do it again, <laughs> you know. But, it was uh, brutal for me. It was brutal. I thought it would take a year. It took two. I mean, it, you know, there, there's a there's a phrase that some famous author said this is uh, I hate to write I love to have written okay. it's all great when it's over but it's 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 it was for me at least it was pretty miserable when I was doing it and I ended up having a lot of help um, and got through it and happy with the results but uh, boy you know it's 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 a challenge for someone like me who's not 
you know, we'll have to get, we'll have to get Rick Salmon on this uh, one of these times because he's done like 42 books or something. Oh, yeah, he cranks them. So does Joe, <laughs> you know, they crank them out. Yeah, yeah McNally. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, bless their hearts, but I I'm not them. Yeah, exactly. So Steve Roberts wants to uh, know, uh, he says, do you think editors will complain about the high starting up stops uh, a lot of the new mirror lenses like the 100, 500? My guess is, and, and I'll- Oh, the uh, lens is for mirrorless, not the mirror. Yes. Somebody did come out with a mirror lens the other day, uh, you know, uh, like the old time, like the 500, 5 micro and stuff, but- I saw that. No, well, editors will complain. I don't think editors really care about the apertures. I mean. The only thing, and this is what I've been told, and this is why I, I stopped using my two to four for football and went back to my four or my six, is is the um, the depth of field. You know, when you are shooting football players on a football field, you're not that far away. Um, you really want to pop them out, especially for AP, who's really looking for individual action. So that was the situation where, yeah, it would look. I mean, even even the difference from two eight to four was, was noticeable. And, and the other problem was, so you're at F4 and then you don't think, and you zoom back to like 300 millimeters. So now you got a 300 F4 and now stuff is not looking crisp. Right. You know, it's looking more crisp. And so that's, that's the only thing. Other than that, I think the editors just care if you got a picture, if it's sharp. That, that was going to be my answer when I read that was, you know, most of the people when I'm shooting, like I've never had uh, Team USA say to me, God, would you shoot that at five six? Like they don't even know what that means, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. They want us to tell the story, and, and they're not very technical. And I guess no, most the other side of that is, like you said, we'll shoot something amazing that's yeah. really hard to shoot, yeah, and then we think it's amazing. Yeah. 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 yeah exactly. But no, I had to climb the flagpole and hold on with you know one hand and all that. They say, well, yeah, but it's they weren't they aren't looking up, you know. So <laughs> there is that. There is that. Um, yeah, but yeah. Most editors are not photographers, and be thankful for that because when, um, well, in particular, when Heinz Glutmeier, another another great Sports Illustrated photographer, took over as director of photography, it was horrible. And Heinz is my good friend, but all of a sudden he became just maniacal. He wanted to tell everybody how to do every shoot. He would call. I'd be here at, in my office working late at 10 o'clock at night. He'd call, it's one o'clock in New York. And he's asking me, um, you know, why didn't I, uh, why did I take that cab? Or, or why did I, he's asking me like these pitiful little things about expense accounts. So, so there are a lot of ways. And Heinz, of course, is the biggest expense account cheater that I learned a lot from him. <laughs> but uh, so having he's a photographer in there, yeah, yeah. Having a photographer in there is not great. Um, editors should edit. And, and there are some great ones. So Steve, uh, Steve Roberts has a great uh, comment here about the uh, Bridgestone Arena has gotten so bright with the LED lights that you don't even need strobes. And I will tell you that shooting the San Jose Sharks games um, with previous lighting versus what they have now is night and day difference. So the, the LED lighting is incredible, the, yeah. uh, how much brighter, not only how much brighter, but the instantaneous, like as soon as the national anthem is over, and they kick the lights up, it's like, boom, it's on. Boom. It used to there's be, no, there's used no, to... none of that 10 minute wait when they used to do the old. Yeah, no, they're, they're great. Same thing with Staples Center. I mean, and especially the way the Lakers do where they light the court and then it's black up, up there. Now the, the Clippers, Clippers don't do that. And I don't like that because now you're seeing up into like the 12th row and there's still light on them. But, but the Lakers really have it down. It's a great place to shoot available. The thing about strobes, you know, we were talking about this the other day with somebody, but they're still useful and they're useful for remotes. Because if you're going to put a remote up, say, on the backboard, um, you don't want to have to go F2 or F2.8 because it's a wide angle lens and you're going to see somebody coming up and you, you, you want to go at F8 because you want to have that focus. And the only way you're going to get F8 is to use, use strobes. And so right. that's the one place where I'd say they're still... They're still valuable uh, after spending years of shooting with them. I, I started out shooting, we used to shoot with Hasselblads. Jeez. Hasselblad, slow shutter, you know, you know, no slow motor drive at best, uh, you know, focused backwards from the cameras we were using. Um, my God, it's, it amazes me when I think back that I ever got anything with that. <laughs> but, uh, 
Um, so what, where I come from, that to go back to go up to shooting available with with just your autofocus cameras, it's 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 easy. It's easy. Basketball's too easy to shoot. Yeah, and actually, the interesting thing about shooting ice hockey is you have a giant sheet of white reflector underneath right, right. every athlete, right? It makes it yeah. easier than shooting basketball or whatever inside. Yeah. So having big LEDs that are coming straight down onto the ice really, yeah, makes for good shooting. Yeah. Um, Patrick wants to know, is there a way to submit to the wire without being one of the uh, big, you know, being part of one of the, you know, AP, Getty, EP, or like one of the big agencies? Um, Sorry, let me, uh, we need to mute some people here. Sorry, go ahead, Peter. Not, not really. Um, they really have so much stuff coming in now. I mean, even the, uh, the contributors, um, if we if we do a game, uh, we'll pop in a couple right after the game. We think we've got something excellent, but mainly they don't want us submitting them because there's so much coming from their staffers and their stringers uh, who are on deadline that they, they don't want to clog up the server. So I think, you know, back in the day, again, as Sports Illustrated, there was a chance of reaching someone. And I, I had some people, I had some students from my workshops get pictures in because because I knew to, who to tell him to call. It was like, call Jimmy Colt. Right. Um, but, but in the reality of today, it's very impersonal and it's just not, you know, there's not really, you would need to kind of build a relationship with the organization to the point where, you know, they would consider looking at your stuff if they thought it was gonna be good. Right, and there's, there, to, to add to that, um, Patrick, there are smaller agencies that are out there that you can yes, submit yes. to. Um, yes. I'm actually shot some stuff for Zuma down in Southern California. Uh, and there's a couple of the smaller agencies that, and I'll get hounded by them during the Olympics because they want, you know, they want content. Um, uh, so those are, that's one way to do it. And that's actually another way to potentially get credentialed when mm -hmm. things open back up maybe, but, but again, you'll be low man on the totem pole. So yeah. Yeah, they're going to have um, fewer credentials when things open up. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Kirk asks, what are the companies like Canon thinking about ways to move their existing DSLR customers to mirrorless gear? Um, existing gear investments make it difficult to abandon the DSLRs. And I can tell you, and I'll answer that and let Peter add to this as well. But uh, a couple things. One is, one of the great things that Canon did with the R is that they have the adapter. Uh, and yeah, so, the adapter. Yeah. Right? And the adapter with the ring, which is the one to get, in my mind, mm -hmm. um, is awesome because all of us have this uh, large investment in uh, in glass and in right. flashes and whatever, and all that stuff works. And the adapter is like a hundred and something bucks, two hundred bucks. Yeah, it's, e it's easy. Yeah, yeah, and and it works great, and you're not losing anything. So, mm -hmm. like, I don't plan. I'm when I get the R5, I probably will not switch to, the, to their seventy to two hundred right away. Although I might, um, I'll probably just use mine. Uh, yeah. I love that lens, um, mm -hmm. and I'll just adapt it and throw it on there. So I think Canon's, uh, what they're trying to do is make it easier for people to jump to the next thing without having right. to buy all the glass, right? Yeah. What, how, do you agree with that, Peter? Yes, I do, totally. And I've used a lot of old glass on, I, I mean, I shot a lot, of, of even of sports with the R, which wasn't really well suited to it, but it, it worked. And I saw no... Uh, it's not like you're using like a Sigma lens or not to knock Sigma, but you know, another company, the Canon lenses are built to work on the Canon cameras and they're built to work on the R series as well as the uh, EOS series. And I think that's, that's pretty much a safe bet. And that's why they did it because yeah. otherwise they would be abandoning all these people or they'd, they'd never sell mirrorless. I mean, that's the thing with Sony. Uh, there's, uh, there are a lot of other people who may, but if you want to stick with Sony, you're looking at, expensive lenses not the canons aren't but the only game in town really you want a 428 for your sony and there are no used ones around because they haven't been out that long so oh, that's true Good point. um you know canon was a you know had a, had the advantage there because they had a pre-existing line of lenses and cameras yeah and, and uh uh steve said that nikon also has a similar with their ftz adapter which right I mean, all these guys look Canon is a very conservative company. I can tell you that yeah. in dealing with them, and Peter's done this as well for many years, they're scared to even switch from Compact Flash to yeah. CF Express or CFast, you know, different, yeah. because 
they're scared to tell all their users, hey, get our new camera. Oh, and by the way, you have to buy new memory cards because yeah. that freaks out people as well. Um, and of course, I've been pushing like, for God's sakes, get rid of Compact Flash. It's old, the pins bend, it's slow, yeah. you know, and they've finally done it. But they're very conservative in all the things that they do. I mean, hell, they had the, I mean, the, the lens connection up until the new RF has been around for like 28 years or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and EOS mount came out in like 88, I think. Yeah. Um, sure let's see here. Uh, Bob wants to know, has anyone tried the old white lenses like the 400 28 on the R5 or R6? Um, and I can tell you that uh, I have not, but I absolutely will. The first thing, one of the first things I'll do is put the 200 to 400. Have you tried that? Uh, no. No, okay. um, I used the 400 to I, t I took the, the R to a uh, Broncos game last year and I, I used the 400 to And, you know, you could make pictures with it, but there's, it had slow blackout, slow viewfinder, a lot of, yeah. a lot of technical problems that weren't about the camera focusing or, or, or shooting. It's just like, you'd lose the player, you know, um, but uh, they're all gonna work, you know, they're all gonna work. And, and this is a better cam, more usable camera for real life shooting. And so I think they're gonna work, work just fine. Yeah, I, I've, I haven't tried it yet. My, my, I suspect that the R5 and R6 with those lenses will be great. Um, I didn't even like the R, it only had one slot for memory cards. And I just yeah. told Canon, yeah, don't bother sending one because I'm not gonna, it's not something I would well, use. Well, I wanted to just try it out. And the lenses are beautiful. Yeah. The R, R and lenses are beautiful, but now you've got the R5 to use them on. But the 50, I have a, I have a uh, 24 to 105 uh, f4, and I used that. I covered the uh, Ironman a uh, year or two ago, and uh, I rode on a motorcycle for six hours. And I just had that 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 lens and a one to four, and that was that was those that was my gear, and it worked great. Were you riding backwards on the motorcycle? No, you weren't that guy. Okay, good. Just checking. I'm uh, not that guy. So uh, Patrick asks, uh, how much value does the focus ring add on the? Uh, adapter or on the lenses for the R and I will tell you it is really cool um, because you can program that ring to be whatever you want and so mm -hmm. you can make an exposure comp you can make it ISO you can make an aperture mm -hmm. whatever yeah. um, I, I think it's I play with it and I think it's really really cool to have that flexibility mm -hmm. to make it what you want do you agree with that Peter or like have you played what do you think well I I will admit that I haven't played with it that much I, I tend to look at a new camera as well let's make it as much like my old camera to start yeah. with and then we'll slowly get used to the new features so i turn off the touch screen i turn off because i'm always moving the things with my nose and you know i turn off all those nice features and then slowly but surely i will integrate them. like with with the mark three uh they're a little new uh kind of i don't know what a touch sensitive thing it's not a, it's not a joystick but that I turn that off at first, but now I use it and I, I see what it does and everything. So it just, it, this hiatus, I mean, I'd be so far along. I mean, I was lucky I got the Mark III in time to shoot two playoff games in the Super Bowl. And then I shot at this workshop and then I you know, haven't shot since, haven't even shoot since. And, and, the, and the R5, uh, you know, a couple of just stuff around the house, birds down at the Manhattan Beach Pier, you know. Not much else. Looking for something. Looking I know. For something. Actually, I have a, sh a paid shoot tonight, uh, engagement sh uh, session I'll do from mm -hmm. six feet away with my mask on if I need to. Um, yeah. It'll yeah. be outside. But man, it's just, it's going to feel, feel so good just to like work, <laughs> just to do something. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so Jeff uh, Mobile, uh, uh, sorry, Mobile Hill says uh, that the Zoom Throw, the 7200 RF, is tough for sports because you can't rack from 70 to 200 without taking your hand off the ring. And I, I, I get that. And I have the same issue with the 100, 400 where you can't easily go from one to four. They'll right, push pull right. dust pump. Yeah. You could, yeah. but um, it's a good point. But I, I think, um, you know, there's another reason to use the older 7200 with a converter if you yeah. want. So, um, well, you, you know, I, I have the 7200 R, R lens and I haven't really played with it that much, but honestly, as I use the, the R5 as little as I did, I really thought, because what I have for my um, EF mounts is I have the 7200 F4. It's smaller, it's lighter, right. et cetera. And I thought, then they make one for the, for, the, uh, for the R5 too. And I thought, 
that would be the way to go because then you've got you're saving a lot because that 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 lens is pretty bulky yeah and i think it'd be a lot it doesn't have the quite the complex focusing that the that the 28 does so i'm kind of looking for that i mean by the time you know who knows i'm assuming let's say football and i'm down there i'll have my long lens and then something short around my neck and then i'll have that 7200 over my shoulder i will probably buy an f4 for that interesting huh. all right um mario is asking any difference in terms of af speed and quality while using the rf adapter and i will tell you that Everything I've been uh, told by uh, Drew and the tech team at Canon, that there's absolutely no loss of anything um, when converting lenses. Yeah. So your AF speed, your quality, everything is. Uh, yeah, I didn't see any when, when I used the long lenses on the R. And I, I've done it a couple of times, actually. And they work just fine. It, it's not, again, it's not like you're using some third party adapter. Um, it's all made by Canon. It's all made to work together. I love this comment from John Delicio. It says his wife just got it, her R5 and says the autofocus is so good. Everyone can be a bird photographer now. And it is interesting. One of the things I thought about is that, um, you know, when I'm teaching on photo tours, like in Africa, one of the things I really work on is the focus uh, and getting the focal point in that right spot mm -hmm. and on the eye and all these things. And, um, and so, now, if everybody's using an R, you just go, okay, everybody put it in animal face tracking. Let's go. Yeah, you know, animal, I mean, wide zone animal face tracking. And if there's an animal face there, it'll get it. Yeah. And, and so it is true that, um, and people have been saying this for years, you know, gee, as these camera phones keep getting better and better, why do you need a photographer? Right. And the good news is that that's still not true. You, this, yeah. you know, the camera is a tool. And this is important to, to say this again. The camera is a tool. It is, you know, you can have the best. I've seen people with a Canon 1DX Mark III, well, maybe not the three, maybe a 1DX or 1DX Mark II, and they don't even know what they're doing. Um, yeah. Or their composition's not good, or their technique is not right, or they're shooting at the wrong aperture, whatever. Or maybe shooting too high of an ISO and they don't need it. There's all these things. So for all of us who are on here, the, having the right tools definitely helps. And, 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 I, and I know Peter would attest to this, that it is still an art form and knowing, you know, I was trying to help someone yesterday with photography doing a private one-on-one -on -one session. And I said, knowing which direction to shoot to get the right light or how to move someone so the background is not distracting. You know, all of these things that, that, that are critical. And so you can have the best camera in the world and it won't yeah. matter, right? But it yeah, is- you gotta know what you're doing. Easier. Yeah, you gotta know your camera and you've gotta have some idea of what, your, what will make your picture better uh, and with, with the light and the backgrounds, backgrounds are so important. Uh, all that stuff, it doesn't matter what you're shooting. Um, that's, that's all crucial stuff. And, and, you know, you can go down to the camera store and drop, you know, six grand on a, on a Mark III and, and, a, and a lens and other, and it's just, it's still, it's not gonna help you, you know, if right. you don't know what you're doing with it. That's right. Um, Patrick asks, any rumors of a 300 or 400 to eight? Um, I can tell you, I have not heard any rumors of, but I can tell you this, you can bet that Canon's working on lenses like that because as Peter and I were saying, the R series or mirrorless is probably the future for Canon and they're gonna to wanna to make sure they support that with lenses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Je Jeff, did you happen to go to the Canon Expo in New York in 2015? It's no. an all Canon show. Okay, no, I, was so I went. I was, I, think I, was in, I was either in Africa or somewhere else in Costa Rica at the time. Well, they brought me in. I, I did a couple of talks, but uh, one of the most interesting things I saw was a 600 F4 DO. A D, DO 600 F4. It was about this long. Wow. Now they had a they had a dummy and they had a cutaway and and because it's the same technology in the 400 F4 DO, and I am just waiting. And and then it didn't come out. It didn't come out. And I thought, well, they're they're waiting for mirrorless. I think you're going to see it by next sun by next summer because they have that in the can for you know five years now. And all and, the and that technology and things and we're converted yeah. for an RF. Yeah, that technology I think is going to come. So you're going to see a 400 to eight, but it's going to be tiny, and a 300 to eight that's going to be tiny, and uh, that's where they're going to. It's not just slapping the same lens as you know a similar version of the lens. They're going to be they're going to massively improve it by by the size and weight. 
Interesting. Um, let's see here. Uh, Carl agrees with you on the 400 2 8 versus the 200 400. He likes the 2 8 versus that 4. I tend to be more of a zoom photographer, so I actually prefer the 200 to 400. And again, this is just where you know it's what you're used to shooting and how you shoot. And Peter and I have different styles. Um, and uh, he's a better photographer than I am, so I mean, I should get rid of my 200 400 and go to 400 2 8. But uh, no, no, I mean, it's framing, it gives you framing. I for the first time I used one, it was like. Hello, framing, you know, right. but you, you got so used to, and again, here's the thing, on a football field, I know exactly where to be to get people the right size. Uh, if you're at the Olympics, where every place you went was different, and every place they stuck you was different, that lens was, was just, oh, God, they gave, them, they gave them to us right before we went over, and it was like, oh, thank you, God, and, and, uh, uh, that's what it's great for. And, and at the Olympics, you always have good light. You have adequate light. So right. you could shoot five, six in there if you had to. Yeah, did, and, um, uh, did, is that before the London Games when you when they gave that to you? That was the London Games, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. we had the prototypes there. And I remember I borrowed one. And I'm like, I'm never giving this back ever. Yeah. Like, And I told him, I said, if we go to gold medal, you better have, because I think they only had like five of them there yeah and like, very limited. if we go to the gold medal game i want that damn lens i don't care what you do i want to borrow that game and they did get it for me i was pretty happy about that um well so we're running low on time and i don't want to keep peter mm -hmm. too long but bob asks um if they ask peter to shoot a player um specific player for a game mm -hmm. shoot that player sure. for the whole game which sounds hard to do um hopefully that feel that player is not on the field or court for the whole game but like are you, have, I've never been assigned to shoot one player for a whole game. I've been texted during the Olympics, hey, we need uh, number 12 because she's in and she hasn't been in or he hasn't been in the whole game or for the last four games. I've also been texted to key in on, you know, Prince Harry or whoever's in the stands. Right, who's ever in the stands. Have you ever yeah. shot an entire game with one, just focusing on one athlete? Yeah, yeah, it's, it, you do it, you know, it, it's frustrating in a way, and especially like someone who's real, this is a classic, uh, Deion Sanders, who at his, the peak of his career was uh, the best defensive back playing in the NFL. So shoot Deion, get us something to Deion. Well, guess what? Nobody throws to Deion. So right. he'd be out there, he was, he was playing safety or whatever. He'd be out there half down with his hands on his hips, kind of waiting around. And I think, I think there's maybe, one pass came his way and all you're doing is watch them stand there but that's because again you know especially in a, in a passing or you know a defensive passing guy it's going to happen once and that's going to be it and, right. and if you if you decided oh no i, I want to get some you know whoever was a roger craig or whoever i want to get so i'm just going to shoot the line and suddenly it's a pass and dion's you know or or the other team and dion's breaking it up you better be there right you know and so um that's what you got to do. I mean, that's what those they pay you to do. Yeah, I think uh, I've had a couple instances. I did a San Jose Sharks game one time where I was, my whole job was not to shoot the game, just to shoot the bench. And what they wanted was they wanted all the other athletes cheering when they scored. So I had to wait for someone to score a goal and then get the bench with all the guys going crazy because they, they, they wanted to skin the stairs to the arena with that image to be, it was my biggest image I've ever had. It was like, 200 feet by 90 feet or whatever. And it was, you know, this giant, and the, all they wanted was the guys on the bench. So I sat there for an entire game, not shooting the game. It was really, it was tough to do. So, uh, and I wasn't using a remote. I was just on the other side of the glass, yeah. just waiting for it. So. Yeah, um, that's what you gotta do though. Yeah. Um, I, I, I need to cut this. We've been over an hour and uh, I know everybody's uh, uh, got time to, you know, the things that they got to do. There's people that are in the UK that are up late. There's people oh, uh, in- Thank and, you for uh, coming. Yeah, there's people, so I, I think we had one person uh, in uh, Australia, New Zealand or somewhere that was getting up real early. So we got people- early over there, uh, yeah. So uh, appreciate everybody's time. Uh, Peter, one, before I forget, can you give everybody uh, the website and YouTube and uh, all that? My my website is Peter Reed, R E A D Miller dot com. Um, my YouTube is on sports photography with Peter Reed Miller. If you just start, it's funny, you search Peter, and there's like the third one that comes up is Peter reading the paper drunk. 
and then, and then you go read Rangers. if you get to read and yeah this is this is on youtube you get to read in there and you'll you'll get it um and uh if you do look at youtube subscribe it doesn't cost you anything yeah. and it really helps me get my numbers up and getting the numbers up is what it's all about subscribe to jeff yeah, yeah. and uh I would advertise my workshops, but right now I don't have any. This would have been, we'd be coming up on my Tennessee, my Rocky Top workshop and not gonna happen. I am trying to put together a virtual workshop and I will keep everybody posted on that. Uh, I have a mailing list you can join. You can join it off my website. Um, I'll probably put it on Instagram and do everything to, you know, um, it'll be something where you stay in your hometown and you find a couple of things to shoot and then send them in so it'd be over a week but it wouldn't be every day be a couple of sessions and then we could go out and shoot and then uh then two days later upload the stuff and then i would critique it probably with, with steve fine maybe have some other photographers talk so um it's really going to be different but it might be good and it's kind of like the only thing i think we can do in this day right. and age and you won't have to pay for airfare or hotel so so look at it that way so That's stay true. tuned on that i'm i'm, I'm researching it and I want to get something together before the end of the year. So yeah, and I should I should uh, also mention that you and I have talked, and I know Terrell Lloyd and I have talked about potentially collaborating. Uh, you know, who knows if it'll ever happen, but it is something mm -hmm. for all of you out there. We've talked about trying to put something together with either all three of us potentially teaching. Mm -hmm. We don't know, um, so we'll see. I see that uh, there is someone from Brazil as well. I should mention that we have hey. people from everywhere. So thank you everybody for joining. Thank you, Peter, so yes. much. Um, thank you, Jeff, for yeah. for agreeing to do this. Uh, I love your work. You inspire me all the time to, to shoot better. So uh, thanks for joining us and uh, sharing your wealth of knowledge with everybody here. Well, thanks for having me and, and everybody who tuned in. Thanks for listening. I hope, uh, I hope this is helpful to you.